What do you see when you look into the face of your neighbor? Do you see a stranger? A friend? A foreigner? Or a refugee? Do you see someone to avoid? Someone to hide from? Do you see someone to hate or someone to love? Can you see yourself in their face? Do you see the face of Jesus? Hey, good morning. It's, uh, it's great to see y'all. Uh, I did not do this uh, first service, but I want to go ahead and, and do this um, right now. Some have asked over um, the course of the morning, um, how's Tim, where's Tim, different things like that. Uh, he went on vacation and is now in, uh, in quarantine uh, and different things like that. So uh, also keep his family in prayer. Uh, Ashley's uh, 101-year-old grandmother uh, passed away this week from COVID, and it's kind of making its way through uh, their family up in Virginia uh, and so on. Also pray for Jim uh, and Bonnie this morning. They're traveling to to Gallup to be with our church there, and uh, that's uh, uh, it's a great thing uh, to see uh, how God is working in that. So as a kid, uh, one of the things that was a mainstay of my life is uh, when I would get out of school on um, in an afternoon, a lot of times I would, I'd walk the two and a half blocks um, from our house to my dad's barber shop on Main Street. And uh, part of that was knowing that if he was busy, he would make me go to the sundry store across the street uh, to get him a Coke, which meant that I got a Coke and a pack of baseball cards. So a little bit of ulterior mood, motive there. But um, when I would get there, there was usually some old timers uh, on one side of the shop. Uh, they played dominoes every day. So that was kind of their, uh, their social outing. There'd be guys in the waiting chair. And uh, I would, uh, I'd plop down and I'd grab uh, magazines or comic books. And it, really, it was probably in this order. It was Archie Comics. Uh, and then after that, it was Field and Stream and then Popular Science. And I, I liked, uh, I liked uh, Field and Stream because it presented how life can be an adventure now. But then uh, when you think about what the popular science, I love kind of thumbing through, looking at all the things that are going to be on the horizon in the future. Now, do you remember what it was like as, as a kid for, for many of us when, when people would talk about what the future is going to be like? And I know for me, and, and growing up in the 70s and, and, and so on like that, in the 80s, the picture is life is going to be like the Jetsons. It's going to be fully automated, and we're going to have all of these neat new things. But as people would talk about the future, a lot of times they would paint a picture that, one, life would be simpler, and the other is we're going to have an abundance of time because of all the automation. Now, with that, I can look at life right now and say, it's not simple. In fact, I would say it's much more complex than it was when I was a kid. And time, well, I, I, I see a lot, feel like I have less time than I have ever had in my life. And, and so uh, time is at uh, very much a, a premium. And as we talk about this whole idea of the art of neighboring, I think one of the biggest obstacles we face in fact, I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and share this. We will either face a time obstacle or a fear obstacle. And, and for me, I, I kind of waffle back and forth between both of those. But one of them, uh, the reality is we have very little margin when it comes 
to time. In fact, we've kind of bought into some lies when it comes to how we live our life and how we, we go about our, our daily business. In fact, one of the things that we will oftentimes say is someday things will settle down. Anybody with me? That, that someday life is going to be better because I get through this project at work or this home project is done or whatever it is. And, and a lot of times what we'll even do is say, when I get around to it, my, my grandmother back in Kansas in her kitchen actually had a round to it. So if you said, when I get around to it, she would give that to you and say, now you have it, get it done. Now, now so we, we kind of have this idea, though, that, that if, if I just had more time, but that really never comes. Also, more will be enough. If I make one more purchase, if I get one more thing, what, whatever that is, we think more is enough. Now, I, I was convicted on this this week. I actually had a friend who's a minister in Philadelphia that actually shared this on Facebook. He didn't share where he got the information, but this blew me away that the average American home has over 300,000 items contained within the walls uh, of that home. 300,000. And, and so more will never be enough. Also, we live with the mentality of everybody lives like this. Everybody is busy. Everybody is stressed. Everybody, and, and the reality is not everyone is. So today, we're going to dive into a story. We're going to dive into a story from the life of Jesus. In fact, uh, in week one of, of our series last week, what we actually looked at was uh, was this right here. We, we looked at the fact that Jesus introduces the idea that everyone is our neighbor, and that when we see a need, that person is our neighbor. And oftentimes, we, are, we really need to understand that the people who live within the proximity of us are included into the category of neighbor, and so that we, sh we should love them as, as we love uh, ourselves. And, and here's the issue we could take what Jesus said in go and do likewise is go and be busy. And I, I really don't think that is the issue. In fact, as we look at this story that, that follows this in sequence in the, in, in the book of Luke chapter 10, maybe it's creating margin in life so that what really matters, we have space for that. So we're going to start with verse 38 here today from, from Luke chapter 10. This is the story right after uh, the Good Samaritan. And this is what it says. Now, they went on their, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. We know this village to be Bethany. Uh, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Now, here's something that's interesting to me is... When, when we read stories in the Bible, a lot of times what the, the Bible writers, the, and I'll even say God does a great job of doing, is when there's a story, we enter into the story going, this is just a normal story. This is just a normal occurrence, nothing big about this, but they add a little bit of tension into play, and as they add a little bit of tension, there's a, a little bit of a a plot twist in, in here. So basically, this story starts out, and everyone hearing this story is thinking, I'm in. I'm good. This, this is just a normal story. Jesus enters a community. He goes into somebody's house, and, and he begins to, to teach and, and, and do life there. But then there is a, a little bit of tension entered into the story. Let's look at verses 39 and 40. It says, and she had a sister called Mary. We also know that she had a brother named Lazarus from John chapter 11, who sat at, at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. So, Take Jesus out of this story, 
you will find yourself to be one of two people in the story. You are either Martha or you are Mary. And if you are a Martha here today, I'm going to tell you, you have problems with the story. But take Jesus out of the story. You've been involved in this exact same scenario, at least to some degree, where you're either the person in the living room with your feet kicked up and you're yik-yakking with people, or you're the person in the kitchen that is laboring to make sure everything goes as planned and, and as it should be. In fact, I'll even go as far as I remember an instance, and this has probably happened many times in my life, but I remember this one in particular. I, I was in a home. We were having this big get-together get with a bunch of people, and of course, uh, after supper, all the Marys got up and went into the living room, and they were, they were just having a great time. Now, in this particular house, there's a dining room, and, and you can get to the kitchen by two different paths. One path is the short one that does not include going through the living room. The other path involves going through the living room to get to the kitchen. And one of the Marthas, okay, decided since everyone else was not helping, that they would walk through the, the, the living room and, and make sure uh, in dramatic fashion to know that they are helping when no one else is. And it happened again, and it happened again, and I can remember thinking, yep, not going to do it, I'm not going to go help. <laughs> but it, 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 I, I remember there was actually a lady in, in our church in northwest Missouri. Her name was Cindy. Uh, Cindy was high strung. So she was high strung, she was raised on a farm, very traditional farm family uh, in northwest Missouri. Uh, and, and then uh, on, on top of that, she's a home ec teacher. And then on top of that, she's a gourmet cook. And I can't tell you how many times in that five years that I ministered in that little church that Cindy would come up to me and say, Brandon, tell me Martha was right. <laughs> tell, tell me Martha was doing the right thing because Martha's get things done and things don't get done unless they grab a hold and, and, and do everything because Marys are just sitting there doing nothing. And, and so think about this. I mean, think about this. If you think about cultural norms, think about the cultural norms here today. I, I, I look at this and say from a cultural norm, you go back 2,000 years ago, Martha is doing exactly, and I mean exactly what cultural norms would say for her to do as the host 2,000 years ago, just a little bit outside of Jerusalem. And that is a reality. And you think about this too. It's not every day God comes into your house in the flesh. It's not every day that the Son of God, the King of creation, the originator of all creation, comes into your home and has your chicken casserole. Think, I mean, think about that. Or if you're a New Mexican, we'll call it green chili chicken enchiladas since that is the casserole of New Mexico, right? And it's not every day, so everything has to be great. And if we want to look at cultural norms, Mary broke all cultural norms. She broke all of them. So if you're in the room, now we're going back 2,000 years ago, if you're in the room with Jesus and Mary comes in, and, and let's just say this is what Mary does. When I give someone a rear end chewing in my house, which is usually one of the two boys that were up here this morning, when I give a, a rear end chewing, what I call that is a coming to Jesus meeting. So Mary has, or Martha has, a coming to Jesus meeting with Jesus. Don't you care? She partially blames Jesus. And then she says, Tell her, tell her to come in the kitchen and help me. And I'm sure before she even went in there, she threw a little water on her face, threw a little flour on her, her, her apron just to make sure everyone knew how hard she was working. And so if you're in the room and, and Martha just calls out Jesus, here's what you expect you expect for Jesus to look at Mary and say, Mary, you know what? Martha's right. 
You need to get in there and, and help out because she's really working hard. Or you might expect for Jesus to say, you know what, Mary, Martha's right. She got cooking duty. You get clean up after supper. But plot twist. Plot twist happens as we look at verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Now, here's one of the things that I love. Jesus does not match Martha's emotion. And from a human perspective, how easy is it when somebody elevates their emotion for us to try to match their emotion? That's where a lot of conflict will come in. So Jesus d does not match her emotion. But notice the words, Martha, Martha. I don't think Jesus was angry. Right? So too many times in my life, that's kind of the, the mentality that I have. I don't think Jesus was angry. I think on the flip side, Jesus was pained for Martha and maybe disappointed in her because she didn't get it. And when I think about my life and I think about us, I don't think Jesus is mad at you. But I do think sometimes he is pained. And I do think sometimes he's disappointed in us because we just don't get it. But here's one of the things that I love is, is the reality that Jesus, what, what hurt for her, was pained for her, but he loved her enough to tell her the truth. Now, you could even say that he led with grace. Martha, Martha. There was, there was inflection probably in his voice that, that showed his care and, and concern for her. But then he said, you are. Now, when he says you are, I, I think the, the expectation would be, Martha, Martha, Mary's right. Or Mary's the one in the wrong. But instead, what we find is, Martha, Martha, you are. You are worried. You are stressed. You are distracted. And I think if Jesus were here in the flesh, and he could speak to us, and, and, and we're stressed about everything going on, and I say, well, my, my job is this, my boss is this, and my spouse is this, and so on like that. I would believe that Jesus would probably look at each one of us as individuals and say, your stress, your overcommitment, your distraction are all on you. When I look at my stress, when, when I look at the fact that sometimes I don't have enough hours in the day. When I, I look at all of these things, I, I, I can blame everything, but I have to realize it's on me. And part of it is, while the, the, the norms are different, we buy into cultural norms. Whether we know it or not, we buy into cultural norms. We, we buy in to the fact that we need to be busy and overextended. Do we not? That's a norm that culture has placed upon us. Work hard, play hard, travel a lot, answer every text, answer every email. Work because work is where you find your value. And, and I'll, I know that, in fact, it took somebody wise speaking into my life because I'm from western Kansas, and I'm from a farm town. And basically, if you're from western Kansas and you're from a farm town, if you're doing nothing, you're not worth anything. If you're not working hard, if you're not putting in a full day, you're lazy. You're a bum. And so I, I get that, that. I buy into that cultural norm that says rest is for the weak. And add to that that today... You know, we it used to be you could work a nine to five job and at five o'clock you go home. Now work is with you everywhere you go. I'll never forget, I was in Disneyland. I was in Disneyland and I got a text from a church member, not long, no longer a church member, I'll say this, but I got a, a text from a church member that says, I need, to, I need you to call me. And I said, we have three other pastors, I'm on vacation, 
uh, reach out to one of them. She said, no, I need you to call me. And it literally was not taking no for an answer. It was like, it could not even comprehend that I wanted to decompress and be away. And that's the world in which we live in. And those are the cultural norms that we are creating. Also, we compare and we try to keep up. Neighbor gets a new toy, new truck, new car, new TV, new whatever. We feel the tendency, we feel the, the trap and the pull to, to make sure that we have the latest, latest phone, latest TV, latest whatever it might be. We want to catch up. That's that 300,000 items that are within our homes. We also have an image. Now, I know not everyone in the room is on social media, but one of the big things that they talk about as far as being on social media is you have your physical self, and then you have your digital self. And oftentimes, the digital self is completely different than the physical self, but part of the problem is everybody presents this perfect image of themselves on social media. My, my wife has said this, and I don't know where she heard this, but she said that we evaluate 100% of our lives based on the top 5% that people are putting out there. And so one of the norms that is developing is we have to maintain our brand, and that is impossible to do. And here's a big one. One of the cultural norms today is this. You've got to be informed, and if you're informed, you better be enraged. Seriously. Doesn't matter what end of the political spectrum you are on, you've got to be enraged, and you've got to let everybody know about it. Heck, somebody this week actually sent me a book um, uh, via email, said, have you read this book? Do you know anything about it? And I didn't, but I love the title of the book. It's by Eugene Cho, who's a pastor up in the Seattle area. Thou shalt not be a jerk. <laughs> because there's a lot of us out there that will, all of the norms that are coming in to be, we forget that Jesus told us to love one another. And we forget that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So let's just be real honest, though. When we fill up our life with stuff, and when we fill up our life with so much activity and running, we erase margin. We erase time margin. And, and here's... Here's the big problem. When we erase margin, we squeeze Jesus and people out of our lives. That's reality. When we don't have time, it's like people on the fringes of our life and then all the way working into our marriage and family get squeezed out when we don't have the time. And eventually, it's Jesus. And one of the beautiful things here, you look at verses 41 and 42. We looked at 41, but it says, But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Did you catch that? One thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. When I think about one thing is necessary in, in the Beatitudes of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, it says, blessed are the pure in heart, and literally means blessed are those who are single-mindedly devoted to Jesus. And Mary got that. She understood the one thing that was necessary in life. And here's the, here's the big thing. Because she broke from cultural norms, she created space for Jesus. Sometimes we're going to have to break from cultural norms to make space for Jesus, for our family, for our church, and for our neighbors. So as we're talking about neighboring here today, let me share something 
This is not an indictment because it's just a reality of the life that we live right now. That doesn't make it right. It's just a reality. But when I'm at Walmart or Smith's and I run into somebody um, that, that comes to church, and, and right now it's happening a lot because we still have a lot of people online and different things uh, of that nature. But one of the things that I have heard even now with COVID, when life is not as busy, people are still saying, I just don't have the time. I, I would love to go to church more. I just don't have the time. I, I would love to serve more. I just don't have the time. I would love to be in a group. I just don't have the time. There's all these different things, and that will filter into, I would love to know the names of my neighbors, but I just don't have the time. I would love to know my neighbors well enough to know what they do for a living, to know a little bit about their family, to be available for them if something were to ever happen, but I just don't have the time. So here's the reality, and this is true. I know even of myself, so I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to y'all. This is our bottom line. We need to go beyond or outside and against cultural norms to create time margin. That's, I, I, there's probably some of you like, Brandon, I just assume you talk about sex or money right now than talk about my time. But that is a reality. And when we do that, we will create space and there will be more space for Jesus. There will be more space for our marriage. There will be more space for our family. There will be more space for us to be able to engage our neighbors, to know them, to be able to truly do as Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So, how do we own this? Here's a couple of items uh, as we think about this. Uh, we, we handed out these, these little things last week, but being that there was a lot of snow and different things, we're going to hand them out again uh, this morning. Uh, we're calling this the tic-tac-toe board uh, of your existence. So if you want to look at your house is in the middle, and this is a refrigerator magnet. So your house is in the middle right now. I get that we're East Mountainers, and our little tic-tac-toe board is not symmetrical, okay? It doesn't line up. It's kind of more looks like a blob than, than it does a board for a lot of us, and a lot of us won't be able to fill in every single one of those. But here's the challenge, and this is the challenge not for today, not just for this week, but we want to kind of carry this throughout the, the remainder of this year to fill in your board, to fill in your board. Now, this isn't about evangelism. or This is about doing the command that Jesus commanded us, love your neighbor. Fill in your board. Uh, fill in uh, the, the, the spaces here. Uh, start with first names. Start with, uh, with you know, first names and last names and spouse and different things like that. Try to gain as much information as you possibly can. Now, I saw something yesterday that this is where it gets tough a lot of our neighbors don't want us to be involved in their lives. I was driving up to, to, the, to the mailbox and, and different things like that yesterday, and I, I noticed a neighbor that was walking one way, but then even saw my car. And it's not like it was going to stop or anything. Kind of did this thing, and then, oh, all right, I'm going to go this way. There's a lot of people that just don't want to be noticed, don't want to be engaged. So this is not going to be the easiest thing to do in the world. So now also, acknowledge the cost of busy and distracted. Yeah, Jesus actually talked about that. There comes a cost, and we're not even talking about the health issues that come with being busy and distracted, but there are spiritual disadvantages to being busy and distracted. One of the things that Jesus did, he told a lot of stories. And one of the stories he told is in Mark chapter 4. It's called the parable of the sower. And, and it kind of gives you the picture. Of, again, we, we have, you know, equipment and stuff like that that does all this. But in the ancient world, they would sow seed. And it's like the farmer would grab a handful of seed and throw it indiscriminately. And, and so Jesus said some of it would fall on the path and some would fall among the rocks and some would 
fall among the, the thorns and the weeds, and some would fall in good soil. In fact, in Mark chapter 4, verse 7, this is what it says, other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And so when Jesus' disciples got by themselves and they were, they were in community, they asked Jesus, what's this mean? Because we don't get this, and I'm glad that Jesus explained it. And in verses 18 and 19, this is what Jesus says about that particular seed. He said, and others are the ones sown among thorns. Those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. You see, Jesus is saying, whether we know it or not, Busy and distracted will have negative consequences in your walk with Him. And when it talks about cares of the world, it can also mean the worries of the world. So there is a cost that comes to busy and distracted in life. Also, practice the art of elimination. I love this illustration. I would love to tell you that it was mine, but it is not. But I think it's so good, uh, I have to use it. But there, again, Michelangelo was one of the great sculptors in the history of art. And he was asked one time, how does he take a, like a block of marble and, and turn it into a sculpture? And he basically said this. He said, the sculpture is already there. I eliminate that which is unnecessary. One of my favorite chapters of the Bible is Hebrews chapter 12. And in verse 1 it says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So I think it's real easy for us to identify that which is sin in our life, to understand I need to remove that. It's a whole other thing altogether to understand that there are aspects of our life, there are, there are activities, there are events, there's all kinds of stuff in our life that hinders our walk with Jesus. And so all the time we're talking about, well, I need to pray more, and I need to study more, and I need to go to church more, and I need to do more, 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 more. We fill in all the blanks of more, but we seldom talk about, in order for that to happen, I might have to eliminate some things from my life. And so we need to start practicing the art of elimination. And finally this. Start with Jesus. I know that sounds simple, but start with Jesus. Uh, a, a few years ago, I reached a crisis point. I've shared this a, a time or two, but I reached a crisis point and um, I actually went and spent a week with a ministry coach and, coach and counselor. And one of the very first things she did after hearing my story was share a couple of verses and give me a book. And the book was called An Unhurried Life. One of the things she said, Brandon, drive is good, overdrive will kill you. One of the, my takeaways from this book by Alan Fadling, which is incredible, in fact, he talked about going to a monastery in New Mexico to learn how to live a, an unhurried life. And he spent a month there. But one of the things that he stated was, Jesus got a lot done, but was never in a hurry. In fact, I love Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. I'm going to read this out of the Message Bible. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. A lot of times we think about our walk with Jesus. We just want to know more. And folks, I'm just going to tell you, this is not about knowing more and having more Bible trivia to impress people. But the more time you spend with someone, the more you will look like them. 
And Jesus' invitation to you and I is walk with me, learn from me. We'll get to understand how to live life when we spend more time with Jesus. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you. Lord, I I thank you for the example of Jesus. And while it is scary, Lord, I pray that we, we trust in you that you are the creator of time, that we have a number of days and we have a number of heartbeats that you have given to us. May we be good stewards, may we be good managers of the life that you have given us. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.